Culture and the Environment. In this unit, we're going to talk about climate change. This is really a big one. Scientists now estimate that the average land temperature in the past 10 years has been about 1.5 Celsius degrees higher than in the period between 1850 and 1900. And this has come with new precipitation patterns, a scarcity of fresh water, changes in the agricultural cycle, uh, increasing tree mortality, changes in fisheries and so forth. These are changes that have been immediately observable that people have experienced in their everyday life and work. So on average, we know that human activity has caused about one Celsius degrees of global warming compared to pre-industrial levels. And much of it has been caused by the anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases, and especially carbon dioxide, CO2, in the atmosphere. Greenhouse gases absorb part of the sun's radiation as it reflects back from the Earth's surface into space, and then radiates back towards Earth as well as in other directions. Greenhouse gases are also stored in soils, in vegetation, in fossil fuels, in oceans, and so forth. And human activities can move some of these greenhouse gases from hydrocarbons or forests, for example, into the atmosphere. And as these activities have increased in the past 200 years or so, the accumulation of atmospheric greenhouse gases has increased, leading to warmer average temperatures. This is a simple explanation. Things are actually quite a bit more complicated with more external and internal influences from the changes in the axis of the Earth rotation to ocean currents, the reflexivity of the Earth's surface in different parts of the planet, the effects of volcanic dust, and so forth. But this is the really the, the textbook basics. And all over the planet, human communities have already experienced for themselves the impacts of warming and changing climates, from devastating storms to melting permafrost, changes in fisheries, melting Arctic icebergs and mountain glaciers and permafrost, more frequent floods, higher floods, bigger and more devastating fires every season, and so on. And here I want to stop and ask you, what have been the changes that you and your community have witnessed that you consider are part of a global trend towards global warming and climate change? Of course, different regions have experienced different changes at different rates. Some have seen more precipitation rates and some have become drier. Uh, first and last frost dates have shifted. Heat waves have generally increased in some places and in others, winters have gotten colder and storms more aggressive. This all has been compounded by growing socioeconomic inequality, increasing dispossession, exposure to toxic pollution, is particularly in populations that are already marginalized in many other ways and therefore more vulnerable to climatic changes. While all of these are phenomena that can be observed locally and have been experienced locally, communities of scientists from different fields have led the work of modeling and prediction at the planetary level and in the long scale of time. And this has been concurrent to a growing apparatus in the past few decades of international treaties aimed at reducing greenhouse emissions. The Kyoto Protocol is the foremost. It was an instrument of the United Nations framework stipulated in the 1990s and coming into effect in 2005. Its successor is referred to as the Paris Agreement because it was negotiated in 2015 at the Conference of the Parties for the Kyoto Protocol that met in Paris in December of 2015. And you will be aware that the United States government announced the country's withdrawal from the Paris Agreement in the summer of 2017. The process actually takes uh, three years, or more specifically four years, from the date of the country's accession to the protocol. And uh, the earliest date for the United States withdrawal is in early November of 2020. There are also institutions that try to coordinate scientific and modeling efforts. So, for example, in 1988, the United Nations set up an institution called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, to produce coordinated reports and studies on the 
causes of climate change, risks, effects, and also to propose concrete solutions for mitigation and adaptation. The ins institution works by scientific consensus and it strives to provide the public and policymakers with objective scientific facts. And this is where Candice Callison, a communication studies scholar, makes in her work what I think is a very interesting and important contribution to the debate. And this is really about the moral implications of the scientific consensus of climate change as it plays out through various communities that are dedicated to converting the scientific message to broader publics. And this is not a simple act of translation. So one of the paradox of the ways that we think about climate change is that it really is about cultural notions and a certain cultural value given to objectivity and to technical and scientific processes and to the scientific method. So it's all about accepting a scientific consensus and facts and modeling and predictions and a certain institutional process where these conclusions are drawn. The way we come to care about climate change, Callison reminds us in her work, is embedded in moral stakes, in ethical perspectives, in understandings of what is right and wrong. And it all of this really is part of somebody's subjective experience. And these are contextual and specific moral engagements with climate change. So you see here a, a tension at place between climate change legitimacy as a scientific object and an objective one as such, but it really comes to matter to people in concrete ways as a moral set of commitments. My question for you is, think back, when did you first learn about climate change or global warming as uh, it is also called, particularly in an earlier period? And then when did you start thinking and caring about it viscerally and to find it a pressing concern? And what is your emotional response to it? Is climate change something you think about in your everyday life? Is it part of your visions and plans for the future, for your life and for your own community? If so, why? And if not, why not? And if so, in, in what context does it come to matter? So anthropologists have taken different approaches to the studies of climate change. And I'm going to focus on three broad ways they've gone about it. So first, a starting point of anthropological research uh, has been the way that people think about and experience climate change as always culturally mediated. So understandings of climatic and environmental changes are also formed through complex power relations and practices that respond to climate change effects can really reshape and have reshaped society's relations to their environment. Second, anthropologists have historicized climate change, putting past and present knowledge, discourses, and practices into a longer historical context. They have paid attention specifically to colonial legacies that affect the international and national stances taken on climate change policy. And they've also paid attention to some of the ways in which climate adaptation has become a new keyword, a buzzword sometimes, replacing previous buzzwords. And third, anthropologists have studied communities of scientists, modelers, policymakers, and community members in other contexts as well as they produce and interpret knowledge about climate change. And the starting point for this work is that knowledge is not just a thing out there, but it emerges in the context of a process. So they have asked who participates in this process of knowledge production and who is excluded? How is the science of climate change mediated politically, culturally, economically, and so forth? And they have also asked how precisely climate change knowledge circulates, for example, from scientific to vernacular contexts. And this is where Candice Callison's work is located. And you have read part of her book in this week's unit. The book is entitled How Climate Change Comes to Matter, The Communal Life of Facts. And it was published in 2014. So in the book, Callison uses this term vernacular, and I want to unpack it for a second. 
She defines vernacular on page 13 of the book as the interpretive frameworks by which a term comes to gain meaning within a group and the work of translation that it must undergo in order to be integrated into this group's worldview, ideals, goals, and perspectives. I'm going to ask you to unpack this. What, what, what does it mean? And can you come up with a specific example of a vernacular? I think that here vernacular simply means an everyday way of knowing and talking about things in, in a shared kind of way within a social group or a community. But it is informal, it's non-scripted, it emerges from practices and experiences of everyday life. So my next question for you is, why would it matter to study how we talk about and make sense of climate change? Why do you think this is an important question or do you think this is not a useful question at all? Please write, write down your answers and bring them to class. So all of these three approaches I outlined just a minute ago are grounded in ethnographic methods. They pay attention to the intricate network of power relations and they also take a holistic perspective, avoiding, for example, climate reductionism. This is when climate change is attributed all of the causality and the ex explanatory power to explain, for example, refugee processes or migration or dispossession. This is an, an approach that takes climate change as the only and main cause. And anthropologists have been uh, writing against that together with many other social scientists. So in her own ethnographic work on climate change knowledge, as it travels between different domains, Callison has studied five different communities in North America for whom climate change has come to matter in particular ways. So she follows members of an institution called the Inuit Circumpolar Council. These are Inuit indigenous people in the Arctic zone. She studies corporate social responsibility activists in Boston. She hangs out with evangelical Christians as they take a stance on climate change. She also studies how science journalists have learned to write about climate change. And then she pays attention and talks to science and policy experts. These are disparate groups that all deal in very different way with the question of the ethical and moral implications of climate change knowledge. And they have particular stakes and effects in a broader public discourse on climate change. Stepping back, this is an interesting ethnographic work because it's, a, an, it's an ethnographic study of knowledge and specifically on the conditions that make particular ways of knowing the world and acting on it possible. The social science jargon for this is epistemology. So the first of Callison's field site is with members of the Inuit Circumpolar Council. This is an institution that represents Inuit indigenous people in Alaska, in Russia, Greenland, and Canada. Inuit communities have been at the forefront of climate change discussion and science because they live in one of the regions in the Arctic that is most immediately vulnerable to it. At the same time, they have been marginalized as interlocutors and, and policymakers. So in the book, we follow Callison to Kotzbu, Alaska, where she's attending a meeting of the Inuit Circumpolar Youth Council Symposium. There is a, a youth and an elder institution within it. So talking to an Inuit elder during the conference, she learns that climate change is not something that Inuit actually talk about, but it's something that they see as existing out there on CNN, on the media. And this at first is a little puzzling for Callison. But later on in further conversation, the chair of the Inuit Circumpolar Council teaches Callison that climate change is just not necessarily the term that they use. Instead, they prefer to talk about the symptomatic changes, the ob observed effects of a changing world and of the interconnections between weather, vegetation, people, animals, and so forth. How one talks about the environment is really how one comes to know it, Callison writes on page 46 of the book. And this knowledge is also about relations within communities, families, and activities of hunting, fishing, whaling, oral history telling, all of these activities where people transfer both formal and tacit knowledge where they pass it on to others. 
Tacit knowledge is another term that social scientists like to use, and it simply means a kind of knowledge that is acquired by doing, and sometimes in ways that are unspoken. So for the Inuit elders that Kalisan talks to, scientific ways of thinking about the environment are just one of the many ways that they come to know places and historic changes. So working alongside their own observations of things that scientific instruments may miss or glaze over, the small and the steady changes of vegetation, fauna, temperature, permafrost, ice, snow, and so forth. So Kalisan's argument here, in alignment with her Inuit interlocutors, is that general discourses and representations of Arctic vulnerability vis-a-vis climate change have in fact further marginalize Arctic people, portraying them, for example, as distant recipients of the effects of climate change, instead of portraying them as experts and as knowledgeable participants with, with real stakes in the outcome. And yet the Inuit, of course, have organized to stake strong claims. For example, the petition that the ICC filed in 2005 to the Inter-American Commission on, on Human Rights in which elders declared the United States had violated the Human Rights Declaration by refusing to reduce greenhouse emissions, which in turn affects Inuit right to life, to physical security, to personal property, to health, culture, land use, and subsistence. And this petition was ultimately rejected. However, it had a tremendous significance because it staked in a very clear term a strong Inuit position on climate change that directly connected it to questions of Inuit sovereignty, health, self-determination, cultural indigenous traditions, and livelihood. So Inuit leaders, they thought Kalisans, were making a claim that connected the planetary scale of climate change to the regional concerns, which they saw as being inextricable and inseparable from indigenous sovereignty and rights. Now I want to talk about a term that often has characterized social scientific approaches to climate change, the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene was in fact a term used in, in the year 2000 by a chemist and by a limnologist. And they used the term Anthropocene to describe what they and many others saw as a whole new geological epoch. This new human-dominated geological period started, according to them, in the late 18th century, after the previous 12 millennia of the Holocene. So they base this date of the 18th century on data from ice core analysis that has shown a growing accumulation of carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere around that time coinciding with the Industrial Revolution and so forth. So the Anthropocene as a concept is emerging in the earth sciences, recognized the impact of human activities as a major environmental force, with impact potentially continuing for the next millennia. There's been debate and other scientists have proposed different beginning dates. For example, for some, the date of the first nuclear bomb explosion in 1945 in New Mexico, or the rise of agriculture 8,000 years ago, or even before then, the impact of human hunting. Others have focused on the disparate effects of local and regional scales and have proposed to think about the anthrozones instead. As geographer Jamie Lorimer points out in an article published in 2017 in the journal Social Studies of Science, social scientists, humanists, writers, artists and journalists quickly took on this new concept of the Anthropocene and they popularized it tremendously. The term in the past two decades has become an umbrella for all sorts of environmental issues. And part of the appeal, according to Lorimer, is that the Anthropocene fully captures the idea of the so-called end of nature that scholars and writers had actually been advocating for during the last decades of the 20th century. This is the idea that um, nature as a place untouched by human presence has never e existed. It's not just that it, that it ended, it's just the idea of it doesn't hold intellectual grounds anymore because it hasn't been useful at all to explain the human presence on planet Earth. So do you find the idea of the Anthropocene useful? 
at all? And if so, in what ways? And if not, why not? I'd like you to stop for a second and list some of the things that this new way of thinking about Earth and climate change does in a useful way, but also some of your critiques of the concept, some of its potential limitations. And of course, there have been many, many meanings of Anthropocene in the past 20 years. There's a group of scholars that Jamie Lorimer refers to as um, eco-modernists. And for them, the Anthropocene is an indication that humans have made and remade the world before, have transformed it in significant ways, and would of course continue to do so. But that better technology could lead to better planetary stewardship for all. Others, by contrast, have called attention to social inequities caused by colonialism, capitalism, neoliberalism, and many other isms. Yet others have usefully critiqued some of the male dominance of the Anthropocene discourse, not just because it features anthros as a genderless presumed male, but also male scholars have been at the forefront of using and popularizing these concepts. They have rephrased it uh, critically and ironically as the Manthropocene. But more seriously, many others have also focused on the colonial histories and its legacies on the Anthropocene, and they have proposed a different start date, one that coincides with the European colonial expansion. Others have focused on the rise of the new social and ecological exploitative practices of colonial forms of capitalism, the plantation, for example, and so they have talked about the plantation of scene. Indigenous scholars have uh, talked about the need for more representation of indigenous voices and historical perspectives in contemporary Anthropocene theorizing. And they have advocated for more ontologically multiple perspectives, meaning ontology is how you think about the world. So thinking about the world in different ways and acknowledging the multiplicity of it, including decentering Anthropos as a bounded sphere, the idea that the humans can occupy a sphere that somehow separated from other spheres and you can put the spheres together to study a coupled system. They instead have um, really asked to start thinking about symbiotic relations instead, the relation between different organisms as they're mutually dependent and transformative. So in short, there have been many critical approaches and engagements with the ways that this first initial earth science formulation of the Anthropocene had been applied to broader social scientific work and to the humanities. And this partially demonstrates the enduring usefulness of the concept, maybe just as a way to start the conversation across different fields and perspectives. This is all for this unit, and I look forward to seeing you all very soon.